All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, this is a particularly good program for this time of year because uh, as an extension educator, I often get just buried in pond questions right around this time of year because several species like to explode in ponds. Uh, before I keep, keep going, though, what I should do is introduce myself because I do see a few names that I, I don't remember. Uh, my name is Bob Bruner. I am an a and Extension Educator with Owen and Clay Counties in Indiana, for those of you who are out of state. Um, this is a regular thing I've been doing throughout the pandemic for the last 18 months, holding online programs like this. So if you're new, thank you for joining us. And if you have been coming to a lot of my programs, thank you for keep on coming. Um, so the program that you're looking at right now, this is one that I actually did last year around this time covering uh, pond weeds, and I will be doing a few more pond programs in the next month and a half or so because it does seem to be a good time of year for them. But the primary thing that we're covering this evening are the different kinds of pond weeds that you find in your pond, what they are, and what you can do to get rid of them. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to just state this right out the gate. There is no silver bullet to any of these problems. Um, I've seen plenty of people who have just got the firm belief that if they dump copper sulfate in their pond, it'll get rid of everything. And unfortunately, that's just simply not the case. But we're going to dive in here, and I'm going to show you a few things, compare last year to this year. So what we're going to be looking at in terms of weeds is we usually separate weeds in two different ways in ponds. So we have our one there on the left, which is talking about the weed types in terms of what the species are, like algae, are they submerged, free floating, root floating, or emergent? And then on the right side, this is how we determine um, how the weed works within the water column. So what you're looking at there, where it says flowering and surface breaching and root structure, these are the traits of the different aquatic plants that we have, not just limited to weeds. But these different traits are also going to tell us how does this weed operate? How does it work within the water? And where is it going to be located? And how is it going to impact me? Because if you have a weed that is flowering, that means that it needs to interact with the air-water interface, which means there are two structures there. There's going to be a leaf and there's going to be a stem leading to a root. Is the depth that this weed occupies very deep? If so, it may be a free floating plant that just is over deep water, or it could have a very long, very, very strong stem reaching all the way down into the water column. And its closeness to shore is also going to change how it operates. If something is very close to shore or right on the shoreline, it's going to have a different treatment method compared to something that's just floating on the water like duckweed or something like that. Now, when we did this program last year, what we did is we talked about primarily algae, free floating plants, and root floating plants, because those three groups represent some of the most um, nasty weeds that I usually encounter. And we're going to talk about a few of those in, in, these, in this program. What I'm also going to include this year is I wanted to cover our submerged plants, because I'm getting more and more questions now about these kinds of plants. And I definitely want to cover some information that should hopefully help you guys out. So let's just go ahead and jump in here. And we're going to start with the first one there, our algaes. Now, this is a simple non-flowering organism that is very, very plant-like. And it is in the kingdom plantae. So it's, it's grouped together with them. But it is not technically a plant. It's a different kind of organism. It is photosynthetic but it can draw nutrients from water sometimes. And they, some of them like to live as colony organisms. They're all different kinds of algae. Basically, if there is water, there is algae, no matter what the water source, unless it's water that just can't be lived in by anything. Now, we often refer to algae as pond scum due to an oily sheen they leave on the water surface. However, however, Zooplankton, tiny microscopic non-plant organisms, can also be referred to as pond scum. And they can leave an oily sheen on the surface of the water as well. Normally, when they die, they'll leave that sheen sitting on top of the water, where if sunlight reflects off it, you can see that kind of rainbow sheen across the water. So it's important that we understand if what we're looking at is algae or if it's zooplankton in your water. Now, most of the algae that you're dealing with is going to form a kind of mossy patch over a portion of the water surface. Usually, horsehair algae is going to be one of the biggest offenders here. 
And other times you're going to see algae that just simply looks like someone dumped a bunch of green paint in your water. Sorry, I've got dogs walking around me and I'm trying to tell them to go sit because they're loud. All right, so let's jump into a little bit of our microscopic green algae that we have. This is perhaps one of the most common forms of algae. This is not something that is bad. It just exists in water, but sometimes it can reach points where it does become a major problem for us. Now, this is very, very important to our ponds, especially if you have a pond where you like either a lot of, if you're a nature lover and you like a lot of organisms around them, or if you are a fisherman because this is going to act as a major food source for a lot of different animals. Algae within pond will turn the color of the pond to something other than just clear, but for most ponds, you do not want green, or I'm sorry, you do not want clear water. You want water that has stuff in it because that's going to represent your food sources. But there are gonna be moments where algae does become this major problem, this microscopic algae. What you're looking at here is an example of blue-green algae, sometimes also referred to as cyanobacteria. And this can happen in any pond, especially if the pond is particularly stagnant or if its drain isn't working very well. Sometimes it can even just happen when weather conditions are particularly conducive, like high humidity, recent rains with runoff, that kind of thing. Now, blue-green algae is toxic. This doesn't mean that if you come into contact with it, you're going to get sick. It does mean, however, that you should be very, very careful with it. Do not ingest it. I would avoid coming into contact with it just in case. You definitely want to keep children and animals away from water that looks like this. It can kill companion animals. It can do a lot of damage to livestock if they drink it. This is because cyanobacteria contains a toxin. And as those bacteria die and their bodies break apart, that toxin gets released into the water column. Normally this happens when something gets into the water. Say you have livestock and your cows like to go to this water source and they actually walk into it. Well, when they walk into it, they're killing thousands of those bacteria, which are then breaking apart and releasing their toxin into the water. This stuff can sit below and on top of the water, so that's why it looks like sometimes someone just dumped green paint all over it. And what you're going to notice too, and this is where your nose is going to be important, and it will be important for just about all these weeds, it will smell awful. It will smell like an open sewer. I mean, really, really terrible. You will smell it for some distance around. It's going to be one of the first indications that there's a problem with your pond but there is some good news with it. Cyanobacteria likes to burn itself out. It will develop very, very quickly, reach absolutely immense populations, and then they've hit that point where their populations can no longer be supported and they'll die. And then your water will just clear up. This is good because that means your water will become safe again after just a couple of weeks. But what I would do is if you're concerned about cyanobacteria in the water, you might consider getting your water tested with your local soil and water conservation district or contacting a pond management agency. Um, I don't like doing guesswork with blue-green algae because it does represent a potential health issue. So I would definitely recommend you could either call me at, or any of ex other extension educator in Indiana. You could call your soil and water conservation district or a pond management agency. Those are the first steps I would take with this. All right, so this one is probably one that a lot of you are already familiar with and is one of the biggest problems, horsehair algae. This is that algae that grows all across the water. It's gonna form these incredibly thick mats. Um, I have seen ponds that have mats so thick you could basically walk from one end of the pond to the other and practically not get your feet wet. Um, it will quite literally look like its name. It looks like millions of strands of horsehair throughout the water and it is very difficult to remove. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times mechanical removal is your best option, but that is beyond backbreaking labor involving a raft and hopefully a couple of people to just rake and pull the stuff out of the water and then take it somewhere where it can be eliminated somehow. Um, there are a few chemical options for it. And I believe our next slide has the, oh, not yet. We're gonna talk about chara first. 
So chara is another form of algae. This is one of those ones that I've gotten more calls about recently that people have asked several questions on, and I needed to do a little research myself to update myself on this. Chara may look like a leafed plant, but in reality, it is an algae. And what this is, people will refer to it as starwort or skunk weed, and for a very, very important reason. Um, when this stuff gets exposed as water begins to drain out of a pond, whether it's drying out or if it's just got drainage happening at it, um, the, the chara will get exposed to air. And when it does, it has this nasty, musty smell. And oftentimes it has this really bad appearance around the edges of your pond as it begins to drain in the later part of the season. But again, this is one of those double-edged blade situations. Chara actually acts as a really good fish habitat too. It gives them lots of cover, places to lay eggs, places where they can actually hunt for food because insects might be around there. So you're gonna wanna make some decisions on whether or not you actually want to remove the chara that you find there. Uh, if you have every year a major problem with the stuff just coming out of the water as it dries up and creating this awful smell, then you may wanna go ahead and remove it. But if not, you may wanna go ahead and preserve that potential fish habitat because it will help your pond and make it a little healthier. All right, so the question that I know a lot of you have probably had, okay, Bob, you've talked about all these different algaes, now how do we get rid of them? So part of it is something that a lot of you probably worked with before, using copper sulfates and copper chelates. And you can find these under all sorts of brand names like Reward or Sonar. Um, and this is perhaps one of the most common methods of using it. Um, these will make an impact on fish populations, though if you are using it judiciously, you will not lose entire populations. It just, it will cause some loss. Um, but it does tend to work. Some algae is, is a little bit more resistant to it than others, so you may want to experiment a little bit with it to see how it works. And folks, hitting this earlier is better. Um, this stuff can get really expensive. You're going to want to tackle these populations so that way they don't get to the point where they've covered your entire pond and now you've just got to use so much copper sulfates. I did mention earlier that physical removal with seine nets and rakes is one option. This is a situation where I, I would not recommend doing this myself, but it is the best way of doing it. It's just, it is backbreaking labor. It is very difficult to get out. If you have people who can help you do it, you definitely want to employ them. Um, but this means that you're not gonna make a major impact on your fish populations as you do this. You just need to time it a little bit so that way you're not stepping on fish nets, or I'm sorry, not fish nets, fish nests um, when they start laying eggs. Now I have seen plenty of people ask or suggest using grass carp to eliminate algae populations. Um, I am not at all a fan of grass carp. For one, they're an invasive species that have spread out of ponds and they become a major problem. Two, grass carp will eat aquatic plants, but they won't eat aquatic algae. So you'll throw a ton of grass carp in your pond, but they won't do anything. They'll just outcompete all of the other fish in your pond and eventually they will be the only fish you have. And on top of that, they're not getting rid of the problem that you got them for in the first place. Uh, one thing I definitely, and I'll repeat this probably throughout the program, is um, contact your extension agent, contact your local salt and water, get someone out there to, to get a second opinion before you make a decision, because sometimes there may be things that aren't immediately obvious to you that people like me can help you out with. We're more than happy to come and make a visit out there and take a look ourselves. All right, so... Let's dive a little bit into our submerged plants. These are uh, a few different plants. And what I'm doing here is I wanna focus on some of the nastier invasive plants. Uh, unfortunately, people have a tendency when they have fish tanks that they like to throw the plants away when they're done with them and they'll just throw them in their pond. And that means that they will spread everywhere. Um, and there are a few plants that have become a major problem because of this. What I want you guys to have is the ability to identify these plants so you know what you're looking at because if you see these plants developing in your ponds, you are soon going to have a problem because they will spread very, very rapidly across its surface. All right, so these plants are rooted in the water. 
And what they'll do is they will have their roots down there and then a portion of the plant will break the surface of the water. So they actually will occupy the water column. Usually you're gonna notice these through either flowers they have or flowering spikes, but these aren't like your water lilies. They're not gonna look like that. These are actually gonna look like more normal looking plants, something you'd see on land just growing right out of the water. And like I mentioned, many of these are invasive. Typical identification for them is done through leaf shape and arrangement, which is very, very stable and makes them easy to identify, thankfully. I'm gonna show you a couple of these. So this one, a few of you may have seen before, this is called curly leaf pond weed. This is an invasive plant. And if you can see the picture very well, you can tell the leaves do have a curling edge to them. It almost looks like something you would find in salad greens. And they will just spread all over the place in a pond very, very quickly. Now, even though this is an invasive plant, it actually does provide some habitat for fish and other wildlife. So there is some small benefit to them, but the problem is, is that they'll just keep spreading and they won't stop unless you stop them. And unfortunately they spread very easily to other ponds too. Another one that I want you guys to all be on the watch for, this is perhaps one of the worst ones, is Eurasian water milfoil. Um, this one I have seen in a lot of ponds in the area in which I work. And this one thankfully is fairly easily identified. It almost looks a little bit like a pine tree. And these leaf, this leaf arrangement here, almost opposite with these long um, peat, uh, leaf stems is very, very stable. It's very easily recognized. So keep an eye out for this one. Now, what I want you guys to focus on too is how we can prevent these plants from spreading. The first thing is please, if you have a fish tank at home, when you are removing the plants from that fish tank, please destroy them either put them in a black plastic bag and throw them in the trash or burn them. Um, do not throw them into a pond. It will cause a major problem for you and your neighbors and they'll just be awful. The best way to prevent these plants from ever developing in your pond is through sanitation. So that means if you're using waders, boots, if you're using a boat, if you take it out of your pond, you need to clean them off, especially if you plan on going to another pond. That is how this stuff likes to spread. Some of these plants will spread just by parts broken off. So you want to make sure that all the tools, all the equipment, all the clothing that you use around the pond is not going from one pond to the other without some kind of sanitation being done. Now, most of the chemical removal for these plants uses things that have active ingredients like 2,4-D, triclopyr, um, I believe diquat is listed. Uh, but what I would like you to do is before you make that decision, we need to check state regulations and local regulations because some counties and some states will have different laws regarding that. So that's why it's important you contact your extension educator or your county agent so that way you can talk to them about what your options are there. And most importantly, many of you at my garden programs have probably heard this before, we need to identify that weed. We can't take an action until we know exactly what we're doing because not all of these pro all of these control methods work on every single weed. That's why we need to identify them. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our free floating plants. These are perhaps some of the most well-known plants that we have. And again, sanitation is going to be something I'll harp on here quite a bit. That's because this includes plants that do not root immediately in soil. Instead, they'll root freely in the water, which means they're just free floating. They can attach to boats, they can attach to birds, they can attach to you, and you can just carry them from pond to pond. That's how they get spread so easily. One of the biggest ones that we see out there is duckweed. These tiny little green leaves you see in the water are actually individual plants. Duckweed will actually form its own roots that just hangs off in the water and that's how they're getting nutrients and other things from the water. What will happen is duckweed will develop and spread across the water surface so quickly it'll just block out all sunlight entering the water, which means any other plants and most of the organisms like the fish and other animals are just simply going to die out because that sunlight is an important part of their ecosystem. Another example, the one that I consider to be much worse than duckweed, is water meal. 
So the larger leaves you see in the water here are duckweed. The little tiny ones are the water meal. Now these don't actually have a root that free floats. The plants are small enough that they can just uh, transpire liquid, they can absorb nutrients right across their surfaces. And they will spread very, very rapidly and they'll spread very easily through animal and human activity. Uh, migratory birds will just carry this stuff because they're tiny and they can't get them all out of their feathers. And then if someone likes to go fishing from pond to pond and they're not cleaning off their boat, this stuff will spread really easily. It doesn't die immediately upon leaving the water. It's actually a very, very resilient plant that is very challenging to get rid of. Now, the best way to eliminate these guys is you want to eliminate an influx of nutrients that they're taking advantage of, and that means runoff. So if you can bolster up any berms or dams around your water, make sure that your water is draining properly because if the water is stagnant, that means that nutrients are just building up and up in your water. Um, if you have a major problem with them, you might considering just draining the pond completely to remove all the nutrients, letting it refill naturally, and hopefully the plants will be killed by that action. Chemical controls are generally diquat and fluoridone. Now these are some of the, they're a harsher chemical and they are going to affect other plants in the water. So that's, it's kind of like bombing your water a little bit. I generally dislike using these chemicals in water because it will have a major impact, but sometimes water meal and duckweed can get to really, really bad populations and they can be really challenging to eliminate. So again, acting early is the best option for you. One thing I will add here that's not listed on this slide is you can remove them mechanically. You can just scoop them right out of the water with some saning nets and a little bit of work. These aren't nearly as challenging to remove as say horsehair algae, but the thing is you kind of got to get every last one because if even a few are left, the population's going to redevelop. But again, the, the labor is not nearly as bad. It's much, much easier. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our root floating plants. Now, someone had a question about these earlier. This is going to include our plants such as water lilies, water shields, uh, spatter dock, and American pondweed. Hmm, excuse me. Uh, most of these plants are going to have floating flowers and leaves on the surface of the water but then it's gonna have a stem leading to an underground rhizome, which makes it incredibly challenging to try to pull these out of the water. One of the things you'll note if you interact with these, I had the opportunity to do this when I was a grad student, is that you, when you touch the water lily or the water shield, it'll feel almost slimy. This is because those leaves are very, very spongy. It lets them maintain a good balance within their system so that way they don't get basically water poisoning or salt poisoning and it lets them absorb water more easily, so that way they can constantly have that source. But the stem and the rhizome is like pulling cable out of the ground. It is really tough. This is not a situation where you want something to spread very easily across your pond to, to have this trait, because it is such a problem. Now, like I mentioned earlier, just before we started the program, these are actually really valuable to wildlife. I mean, we've seen probably millions of examples of artists and other things where you see a little frog sitting on top of the water lily or, or on top of a lily pad or something. So they're kind of a part of our consciousness. They are a part of our ecosystems for a reason. Um, but it's when they get out of control is when they become the problem. So you want to make sure that if you want to keep these plants in the water, you've got to keep them pinned in. You want to make sure that they don't develop out of the area that you want them in. Now, here's an example of a water lily, and you can see it's got that kind of shape you always think of when you think of a lily pad with that nice uh, whitish yellow flower there. Um, these are very, very common all throughout Indiana ponds, especially in my area. I see them all the time. I think they're gorgeous, but like I said, they can become a problem because that big broad leaf you see there can blot out a lot of sun. And then if you look at this picture I'm showing you right now, look past the water's surface. You can see the stems underneath the water there. Now imagine trying to use like a motorboat. Those will get curled up in all of the machinery real easily and real quick. 
or if you want habitat for fish to hide in, this works as well, but it will make it a little challenging to fish in that because the line will get hooked up and all that. So keep in mind that double-edged sword when it comes to plants like these. Water shield is a similar plant, though not nearly as aesthetically pleasing in my opinion. Um, these are a little bit diseased, so they can look a little bit better than this. They're not quite as large, they're not quite as broad. Um, they can add some green color to ponds, but really you can see how close together they're grouping, which means there is no sunlight passing that surface, at least not very easily. American pond weed is also another nasty one because here you don't even need to look hard. You can see the stems going through the water column right there. So there is a problem that is steadily developing. And if you look towards the top of the picture, you can see that this infestation is going even further back into the pond and undoubtedly further forward below the picture too. Um, I see a question in here. Is there a depth at which water lilies stop naturally? Um, I don't know what depth they would stop naturally at. I know some of them can have fairly lengthy systems to them, but I don't tend to see them in the deepest portions of water that go beyond like 15 feet, um, at least not in the areas in which I've worked with them. So I would say like if your pond is nice and deep, most likely you, you probably have avoided most of the problem there because remember growing that stem is, is a lot of energy. They've got to expend that energy to rise above the water column to be able to have their photosynthetic surface actually reach the sunlight. So they're probably going to favor more shallow areas to start with. And as they begin to fill up those shallow areas, they'll push deeper and deeper until there's just simply uh, too much water there for them to be able to deal with. So I would say um, while there may not necessarily be a depth at which they stop, most likely they're just going to favor the more shallow areas no matter what. All right, another one that this one I think kind of resembles water lilies quite a bit. This is called spatter dock that has that big broad leaf to it. The flowers for spatter dock are yellow though, and they're a little bit different shape. Water lilies have that kind of almost uh, spiky appearance to all the petals on the flowers where spatter dock is a little bit smoother petaled. Um, again, I consider it kind of a pretty plant, but, but again, you have to keep it under control. All right, so how do we manage these? Obviously, like I said earlier, sanitation and prevention is the most important part. If you don't want it, don't bring it there. Clean up your boats, clean up your tools. Um, mechanical control can do it, but that's, again, you're looking at some backbreaking labor. This stuff will root, it'll have rhizomes that will have multiple attached stems to it, making them really tough to remove. And it's definitely going to uh, embed itself in the surface of the soil under the water there in the sediment. So you've got a challenge ahead of you if you want to remove them physically. Uh, different chemical controls are an option. Uh, usually it's going to be something with glyphosate in it. That seems to be the most popular option for that one. So I would consult with a pond management agency or an extension educator or county agent before you decide that you're going to chemically treat these because it is quite literally our job to help you understand what's going to happen when you do so. And we are more than happy to answer questions on that. All right, folks, we are right at half an hour. All right, so I timed that perfectly. Um, I've got my contact information here for anybody who is wanting to get a hold of me to talk about these problems. I've got the numbers for both of my offices. I also have links to our Purdue Ed Store and our Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. Our Ed Store has publications on all kinds of material that can help you solve problems like these weeds or anything outside of the water too. And our Diagnostic Lab will help you analyze samples and get to the root of the problem to help you figure out what's going on with your plants.